Wait, wait, is this thing on? What a treat we have today. One of the hardest working, kindest people in this industry. Dan Pink is right next to Dory on that list. Somebody who is one of the top business thinkers in the world. Don't just take my word for it. Somebody who has written books that have changed a lot of people and is secretly a playwright. You've already guessed who I'm talking about. Hello, my friend, Dory Clark. How are Seth, you? I'm so glad to be hanging out with you. Thanks so much. Okay, so most people who are watching know the drill, but just in case, if you post a question in the comments section, everyone will see it, including us, and we will do our best to answer it. Because you showed up on time, you get to see this, which is there are door prizes. That doesn't mean you win a door, but it does mean that there is a chance that something will come to you in the mail. But only if you live in the United States. I'm sorry, it's not um, ethnocentric. It's just the Postal Service. We have a new book for me that came out yesterday, which I was thrilled is resonating with a lot of people. You can find out details at sess.blog slash song, reminding you you can post a question. But mostly, we are here to talk about the work of Dory Clark, the long game, one of the best book covers of its year, and lots of other things. How are you, my friend? I am so good, Seth. Thank you. And how how are you doing? I know that you know the the period up to a book launch is often mayhem, and you know you've you've been in this particular rodeo many times, so I'm sure you can pace yourself better than others. But you know how how are you doing? Have things been crazy for you? If things are crazy in a book launch, it's because we make ourselves crazy. And part of it is buying into the fraud of the New York Times uh, bestseller list, which I have been talking about for more than 10 years. It is the only thing the New York Times knowingly publishes every week that is factually incorrect. And so we get tied into knots because we're looking for a sort of status. The other thing that can tie us into knots is we've lived with this thing. It's personal. We put it in the world. And then some people say they don't like it. And it's so easy to get hung up on that. Um, and the discipline, first of all, is not to read the reviews because you're not going to get to write that book again anyway. And secondly, to realize, you know, if somebody walks into a pizza place and says, I hate this place, all you have is pizza, you shouldn't take it personally because you're a pizza place, right? And so being able to say to people, it's for you, and to someone else saying gracefully, it's not for you, is a really useful skill. So, but yeah, I did a lot of podcasts and I'm a little tired, but it was worth it. It was worth it. I, I can imagine. You know, one thing that I'm actually really curious about, I feel like, you know, years ago, you sort of started as a, you know, as a marketing guy and I feel like you've evolved so far from there. I mean, what you're what you're talking about is about marketing in the sense that marketing is about life, but I feel like it's... And it's not just leadership, although this is a leadership book. I, I feel like it's kind of um, wisdom literature almost. And I'm curious, like, how you think about yourself, how you think about what you're trying to accomplish. Okay. So if someone goes back and rereads the early books, what they will see is that they were always trying to be what I'm doing, but I had to put them in a different box to get them mm -hmm. to the world. And what I find extraordinary, two things. One... People think the stuff they hate about marketing, like spam and hustle and hassle and people putting you in a bad situation and uh, ridiculous consumption are somehow my fault. But that's not marketing. That needs a different name. And I was really lucky in my timing. I showed up just as the old marketing was dying. The marketing of mass merchandising, the marketing of network TV. So I got to announce what marketing was going to be. And so I did. But the other thing that surprises me is people who stopped reading my stuff 10 books ago start asking me questions about, you know, how do I make a remarkable product? I'm happy to talk about that, but I haven't written a book about that in a very long time. So what I've been trying to do is teach people how to bring their humanity to work because we got waylaid into believing that our job is to do what the boss and only the boss wants for today. That the purpose of culture isn't to enable capitalism. The purpose of capitalism is to enable culture. And you know, when you show up with absolute zero, you are doing something that somebody can say, is that the best way for Dory Clark to make a profit? And the answer is, of course not. But it might be the best way for Dory Clark to make an impact. It might be the best way for her to live the best Wednesday 
possible. And so do that. And so I feel like I'm being consistent, but yes, I sometimes put a different label on things because you got to figure out how to get the wrapper through the door before someone opens it. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting stuff. I mean, just, just to follow up, um, because I'm curious about this, is it that because marketing is just sort of more immediately understandable to people as a category that, that, that was, that was kind of your way in the door. And then once they realized this Seth Godin guy has interesting things to say, they were open to a broader range of information and ideas from you. The easiest way to sell a solution is if people know they have a problem and there are lots of people who wake up in the morning saying, I have a marketing problem. And they, once they realize they have a problem, have resources to spend to solve it. There are not that many people who wake up in the morning saying, I am having a meaning in the modern world, culture, understanding, living a good life problem. Although because, these days, I don't know about that. I think right. maybe they do. Well, but they're not necessarily ready to spend time and energy to solve it. And um, so... I have to keep dancing between the part of me that knows how to sell a thing and to make a thing popular and the part of me that wants to do things that I'm truly proud of. And so there's no SEO on my blog. There's none of the things that you're supposed to do on a blog to get more readers. I don't pay attention to how many readers I have. I have no idea how many people follow me on LinkedIn because if I paid attention to that, the other part of my brain would turn dials to make the numbers go up, right? And what's so cool, you and I have known each other now for what, 10 years or something like that. Yeah. You are similar in that you are so smart about what makes people tick and so good at connecting with people that you could have turned it into this whole Shark Tank extravaganza, Mr. Wonderful, cameo, blah, 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 blah. And you haven't done any of those things because you're playing the long game. I mean, you wrote the book about it. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate it. All right. Let's take a look at some of these questions that are coming in because you got us off to such a start. I don't know where all these questions. This is like the most questions we've ever gotten. Um, but most of these people are just saying hello. They're a very friendly bunch. And we've got a few people from Bangladesh who uh, want me to make sure I'm recognizing that Bangladesh is in the house, not to mention New Jersey. Okay. So, uh, and... Ambassador Bruni is here. I'm looking to see if he's got a question. Hold on. Keep going. Everyone's saying hello. This is great. Here we go. Let's talk about this one. You go first. What is the role of AI in your work, in marketing, in what we're going to be doing tomorrow? Mm. Okay. <laughs> what is the role of AI in marketing? I think in the near term, the role of AI in marketing is just to unleash a horrifying torrent of spam on all of us because already so you know all all of the people who are sort of looking for volume rather than quality are like oh this is fantastic let me let me throw things into here and then i will output things and i mean okay um it it is it is remarkable it's va it's amazing to see it just like spit things out and have it be as good as average, or maybe even a little bit better than average. I mean, that's kind of a miraculous thing to watch in real time. Um, but it, it means, you know, one of my favorite quotes that I keep coming back to is uh, by Herbert Simon. And at the, you know, at the dawn of the internet age, he, he said that when, you know, essentially I'm sort of uh, paraphrasing, but when there is, when there is too much of something that means there's going to be <laughs> there's going to be too little of something else and so when there is too much information that means there's going to be too little attention and it was true of the internet it was true it's true of ai and so i think that we're going to have this reckoning because we're going to have a a whole new wave of just kind of junk that we have to wade through in order to get to the gems. So I think that's, you know, I mean, of course, there's going to be displacement of, of the bottom, you know, the, com the commodity level uh, workers. But I think that's, that's the main thing that I'm seeing in the short term. What do you think, Seth? Well, you know, it's fascinating. Whatever system we build, when attention is at stake, people try to play it. They try yeah. to game it. So watching these comments go by, there's a guy who like, Every seven comments posts the same cut and paste. Please follow me on LinkedIn. Please follow me on LinkedIn. He's working the system. He's just doing his job. This is just, well, guess what? I've been online since 1976. 
and I've been doing it professionally since before the World Wide Web. And every time a new system comes along, some people think, oh, I've got this shortcut to extract the maximum amount of copper from the copper mine. And two years later, they're gone. Every single time that there's this short-term hustle that says, oh, I can use AI to impersonate this and to trick people into thinking that and to do this and suddenly put all this new noise in the world. Aren't I smart? And then two years later, or in the case of the internet so fast, two months later, they're gone. And what the long game is about is being human. It is about saying, I know how to get closer to the danger zone, but that will make me a cog in the system. So what AI is really good at this minute is giving you mediocre ideas so that you as a person can raise the bar and make them really good ideas. So when we were writing this, when I was writing this and I was working with Nikki on the subtitle, I, we got stuck. So I put five pages of the book into chat GPT and I said, can you give me 10 subtitles for this book, please? And it gave me 10 mediocre subtitles, which opened the door for us to write the actual subtitle. In the long run, I think people are misunderstanding a couple of things about AI. One of them is, uh, what is it good at? It's good at two things. It's really cheap and it's always on. This idea of omnipresent, persistent, small bits of insight is gonna transform an enormous number of industries because everything else we're used to is the opposite. You have to ask for it and it's expensive. And then the second thing is, this is as big a change to our world as electricity was. And the people who were poo-pooing electricity when Edison and Westinghouse were arguing about electrocuting elephants, those people, are going to be really surprised because you know the steam shovel totally revolutionized the ditch digging business and this is going to be time we're all ditch diggers and suddenly there's a steam shovel here so it's going to be interesting i think getting smart about it is probably the first thing you need to do you need to use it you need to understand it you need to uh, not necessarily use it professionally but be prepared to use it professionally okay um what do we got here? Hold on. Moving up. I am not even going to read this one. I'm just going to put it on the screen. Noreen says, what do you suggest when you're older and haven't yet made the impact you would like to make? Always doing the dance between short-term impact and reward and the long-term in terms of my contribution. I have a small rant on this and I'll let you think of your rant. My small rant is nobody has ever changed everything. Nobody has ever done a performance that made every single person in the theater happy. The goal is not to make the biggest possible impact. It's to make the smallest, useful, significant impact. Have you changed the lives, even a little, of five people? Could you do it again? 10 people's lives changed. That could make a difference, right? Between Dory and I, we've sold millions of books, but not hundreds of millions of books. And there's billions of people on the planet. We're not trying to do this thing that only works if you're number one on every ranking. It's, is there someone who would miss you if you were gone? Is there somebody who gives you the benefit of the doubt? Then can you do that again? I think that's powerful, Seth. I love it. And uh, just before we got on, you were... Um you know, lovingly disparaging my, uh, my Yiddish. So let me, let me take, kick, kick it up a notch. Uh, I'm going to quote Rabbi Tarfon to you here. Uh, you are not required to complete the work of perfecting the world, but neither are you permitted to desist from trying. I feel like that is one of the most powerful quotes ever. I come back to it a lot. Um, so That's I think great. it's the process, you know, we're, we're doing the work. That's great. That's beautifully said. All right, we have a doctor in the house. Sarah Beth asks, how do you balance the pressure of staying authentic, not caring about the status and stats, but when you're just starting out, need to know that what you're doing is performing, that people can find you and your content isn't lost in the digital space. You want to go first, Rabbi? <laughs> All right. So Sarah Beth, that's a, it's a great question and it's an important one. I, I think I think there's nothing wrong with looking at metrics, right? It's 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 sort of like there's nothing wrong with social media per se, right? It it becomes bad if if it, if we misuse it, if we let it run us rather than uh, than than using it as the tool that it is. I mean, of course, you know every 
everyone who's watching wants to have ideally the the biggest impact they can just in terms of like making the change that they want to to make so that's that's a good goal um it only becomes kind of pathological or pernicious if we're constantly like oh how many views now oh if i if i use this keyword is it gonna go up uh, you know we don't want it to, to kind of rule our lives but using it as a, a periodic check to see oh you know did did this post seem to resonate oh wow maybe this is helping people more more than other things maybe i should explore doing a little bit more of it seems perfectly plausible and reasonable to me especially as you're finding your audience Beautifully said. I have uh, some things on this that people may have heard before, but the first thing I'll say is this. Authenticity is a trap. It was sold to the population, particularly to women, about this trick that if you just reveal enough of yourself, you're being authentic, and that is what the internet will lead up. No one wants you to be authentic. If you go to a doctor for surgery, you don't want her to do authentic surgery if she's in a really bad mood. You want her to be the best version of herself. What we actually want is not authenticity, but consistency. We want you to make a promise and keep it. That is what your audience deserves. It's what they're asking for. They don't care that you're having a bad day unless you're that certain kind of punk performer that just needs to air their laundry, but you don't want to spend your days doing that. So the second half of that then is, what change are you seeking to make? And who are you trying to change? If you're trying to, quote, get the word out there, get it out to who or to whom? I don't know which one it is. And that's why you don't need to spam the world, right? That Social media, if it's working for you, is fine. I don't actively use social media because it wasn't going to help me with my journey, make me better. But what I do think about every single day, can I write something that someone who reads my work will benefit from sharing on their account in social media. Because if people talk about what you are doing, the word will spread. If you're having trouble doing that, it's because your model motto might be, you can pick anyone and I'm anyone. And if you're a wandering generality, easily replaced, well, then of course you have to keep hustling. But what would happen if you did that scary and generous thing of going to an edge where others fear to tread, where you can do that sort of generous work. So let's see what else we got. We got time for one or two more questions. Now people are warming up. Okay. Um, so Lee, we, I think we just covered that. So I'll put that on the screen just to give you uh, a high five for that. And here we go. No, I don't want, I, when people ask for brands, I get into trouble. Um, okay. That's a good one. Uh, here, we're going to tee this one up from Marion. I love Dory Clark's focus on your breakthrough idea. Question to Seth and Dory. What is a great way to measure how your breakthrough idea will, not so that before the fact, have impact? So first, catch us up on the breakthrough idea, Dory. Ah, well, thank you, Seth. Thank you, Marion. Good to good to see you here. So um, Marion's a member of my recognized expert uh, community. So he's largely referring to this book that I wrote, um, Stand Out How to Find Your Breakthrough Idea and Build a, a Following Around It, um, which, uh, which I, I wrote a few years back. And the, the basic idea is that in order to, you know, really make a contribution, Ideally, we want to be saying something new, you know, it's just making making a contribution in the realm of what we're doing. This is not easy, of course, because for all of us, um, the initial thing is, I don't have anything new to say. What, you know, what's special about me? What can I contribute? Um, but it's, it's kind of a, a call to just dig a little bit deeper. And, you know, first, I think we need to familiarize ourselves with what's actually happening in the field and the discourse around us so that we, so that we know what the conversation is. And then find a way to, to look for the holes in it. You know, who's not being served? Is there an audience that's not being served? Is there, um, is there a step that's missing? Is there, uh, is there a way that this is somehow not complete that, you know, if I ruled the world, I would say, oh, but, but maybe, maybe this too, or maybe this use case. And that often is how we can really make a contribution to the, the group that we want to be serving. I wonder if we put too much pressure on ourselves, if we call a breakthrough idea a breakthrough or even an idea. 
Because the chances that somebody is going to come up with something that no one has ever thought of ever before in history, and they can prove it, are very small. So like I talk all the time about how I invented email marketing, and I joke about how I invented the everything bagel. That's a whole other story. Um, the everything bagel is at some level a breakthrough in the sense that somebody decided to mix the six ingredients on top. But the reason it works is because it's so easy to find a niche in your brain for it. And the hardest part about building email marketing was coming up with the word permission. Because once I said permission marketing, people instantly understood what it was about. But when you said email, which was sort of amorphous in the 80s or 90s, and added the word marketing, which was sort of disrespected, you didn't come up with something better. And so what we're actually seeking, if we're going to make an impact, is do you have a story, not a jingle, but just an emotional story that hooks into what people already want to believe? And then can you consistently and persistently and generously, unlike this guy who keeps posting that you should follow him on LinkedIn, generously say, this will help you get to where you want to go, right? So if we, if we talk about absolute zero, the spy genre is not original, right? The, the genre of referencing things from science fiction and, and physics is not original. But what you have put together and then putting the musical spin on top of it, that could resonate with people the same way uh, Lin-Manuel's Hamilton resonated with people. But what did he invent actually? So what makes it a breakthrough idea is you're giving somebody what they needed, which is they knew they wanted it. They just didn't know what to call it or where to take it. I think that's a, a great point, Seth. I love it. And I, I'll, I'll just, a quick addendum to it is that I agree. I think sometimes people totally psych themselves out. And so one of the drums that I like to beat is that often we, we don't really even know our breakthrough idea until we back into it. I had been in business for myself probably seven years before I even kind of figured out what a breakthrough idea could be, mostly by uh, experimentation and by accident. So often it's more even about observing what it is you're doing that seems to be working and resonating and then noticing that. I got to say, the energy from your tribe of folks is <laughs> off the charts. Everybody who joined because you're friends of Dory, thank you for being here. I'm a friend of Dory. We're not going to take up your whole day. And I am just thrilled. I've known Dory for a long time and intend to know her for a long time to come. Uh, thank you for being part of this. Keep making a ruckus, everybody. Take care. Thanks, Dory. Thank you, Seth. Great to see you and great to see everyone.